Hey guys, welcome back to another thrilling episode of Yes Users podcast. Today, our guest is none other than Pratibha Das, the founder and director of Flugelsoft. With over 25 years of experience in diverse technology domains, Pratibha is not just an entrepreneur but also has a rich history in networking, programming and now guiding businesses and startups through the dynamic landscape of web3 technologies. Get ready to dive deep into the future of technology and the insights from a true expert. So Pratibha ma'am, welcome to Yes Users podcast. How are you feeling? Thank you, Avinash. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me and I'm looking forward for today's show. Awesome. So please tell us about your journey. You have had a very interesting journey and professional career. And uh, please uh, start from as early as you remember and with the Fugal Soft and the amazing work you guys are doing there. Yeah. So um, we are from the Fugal Soft uh, group and... Uh, which is uh, more than 25 years. Basically, we started with uh, software development uh, and our business was with US, UK and uh, other English-speaking countries. So we were into uh, software development, mobile apps, e-commerce stores and uh, similar business applications. So with changes in technology, we also make changes accordingly. And... um, now we have uh, ventured into Web3 technologies such as uh, metaverse, cryptocurrencies, uh, tokenization, blockchain, and so on. And also we are into uh, angel investing in healthcare and fintechs and uh, the sustainable ecosystem. And we facilitated uh, partnerships of uh, tech companies looking forward to partner with uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, especially in India. So that is um, what we do. And uh, regarding my entrepreneurial journey, actually you can say it started very young as a fascination. So when I was yeah, in high school, I read this uh, fictional uh, scenes uh, by Barbara, Barbara Taylor Bradford. It was a quite famous novel and the whole series was quite famous. Uh, it was about a uh, matriarch running a business empire and uh, along with her nieces later on, so that brought the fascination for business. and But again, that was only a fascination and a daydream, not an actual concrete thought plan. Then uh, in college, after my 12th, uh, which I did in pure science, uh, which is Finnish chemistry, maths, bio, although I had uh, gone for the science too, I wasn't really keen on engineering uh, because uh, the branches of engineering didn't, didn't uh, attract me like chemical or mechanical. And uh, d- during our time, computer engineering was not prevalent in uh, most of the states and including my whole state. There was not much awareness uh, towards computer engineering, uh, but I had my fascination for maths. Hence, I uh, opted for math statistics and economics for my Bachelor of Science. Uh, nearing my completion of my post-graduation, as I observed, I realized the importance of uh, uh, learning a programming uh, language to strengthen my resume as well as skill set. So I visited a nearby um, Aptech center uh, called Asset International. And during that time in the late 90s, they had introduced a course which was a diploma in hardware and networking, which was a career uh, where you had, had to handle large IT networks uh, with routers and switches. So uh, you could have a good lucrative career in as a network engineer or a system administrator. So I got into that diploma course and I learned that uh, they had international certification like Microsoft Certified System Engineer, which is MCSC, uh, and Cisco Certified Network Associates, which is uh, CCMA. And if you do this international certification, uh, there are great opportunities in your career as a network engineer. But again, you know, these were online exams and they were held only in the metro cities like Bangalore, Delhi, Mumbai. So that was the reason uh, we I shifted along with my friend. We shifted to Bangalore and uh, we started studying and applying for these exams. After I completed, there was a usual struggle of a pressure and I tried my luck in a lot of IT companies. And then um, I got a lot of opportunities in MNCs like IIHD, Toyota Cluster Motors, and Infosys uh, in Bangalore. So now mid-20s and early-20s was a time of survival because 
I also had lost my parents and prior to that, my mom was also battling with an illness. So it was uh, basically my focus was uh, to get established and uh, for survival, I to get established. I continued on my journey when, uh, when I met my husband. That was when I got more interested into business because my husband was um, already into business. He had started a software company called Beacons Private Limited. So I was really interested in his work and I decided to, along with him, we planned and we founded a Google Soft, uh, which was uh, a company which did with software development. And so my entrepreneurial journey started uh, with a company where we developed e- uh, e-commerce applications, mobile apps, and, and so on. Then later, with changes in technology, we advanced and now we ventured into Web3 technology. So you can see my journey is about a learning and adaptation uh, for my passion for technology and innovation. Wow, such an interesting story. So, uh, ma'am, for our listeners who don't know about what is Metaverse, can you explain the term Metaverse for a layman and how is it different from the current internet? Yes. The metaverse, you can say, is an enormous interconnected virtual world. You can say it is like a advanced video game. But the thing is, we don't only play the game. We are into this game. It is like an immersive experience where in this virtual world, we attend events, we, we meet people, we shop, and we work. So um, usually the internet is uh, text-based and flat. But the metaverse is 3D and virtual and immersive. So what happens is here uh, we have our avatars, which is a digital version of ourselves. And uh, we can walk around, interact with others and uh, do business and so on. So it's actually like stepping into the internet. We don't uh, only play it. Uh, we don't just look into the screen. We are talking immersed in the virtual world where we ourselves are the characters in the form of digital avatars. It's in the 3D form and we can interact with others as well as do business, uh, entertainment and socialize. That's, I'm going to say, oh, an overview of the metaverse in very lame term. Wow. Makes sense. And you know, when Mark Zuckerberg said that the VR will be the future, we, we kind of made fun of him. But when Apple came out with its uh, Apple Vision Pro, everybody yeah. started taking VR seriously. So is yeah. there any specific use case uh, that, uh, in your opinion, stands out? There are a lot of practical applications of the metaverse, like uh, in different fields, uh, whether it be in the entertainment and social media, whether it be, you know, working live or education. Like suppose um, um, in the social life, we can interact with others through our digital avatars. Then, you know, what happens is that when we use our digital avatars, we are using our expressions, our gestures. And so when we interact, Instead of a traditional video video call, when we interact is more in real time and it is more lifelike. So we can be entertained. One thing is uh, nowadays a lot of artists, they have uh, virtual concerts. So you, you don't have to leave your home. You can just attend these concerts in a live version right from your homes. And uh, you can visit virtual museums or you can uh, visit your friends, friend in Europe and do digital shopping. You can walk uh, uh, with your friend in the avatar form and you can do digital shopping. And so on. And also you can socialize with them. So that is one of the use cases then in our work life. It can be more collaborative. But you know, it, it, it is revolutionized remote work. So what happens in remote work sometimes we're isolated. But uh, what happens in the metaverse, uh, there are a lot of uh, platforms like VR Chat, uh, then uh, Horizon Rooms. So through these platforms, you can work on collaborative projects. So it um, fosters a sense of presence and teamwork. Instead of the traditional setup where we feel isolated, here we can uh, work as a team. So that is one of the use cases. Then thirdly, it has revolutionized application experiences. So um, through the metaverse, you can visit virtual labs, uh, go on field trips. You can engage with your subjects in 3D. You can engage with the content in a dynamic way. And for say, for example, for medical students, they can uh, do surgeries, virtual surgeries before they actually do surgery on a real life uh, patient. So this can help them in enhancing their surgical skills. This is one of the use cases of the metaverse. So there are platforms like Engage and Class VR. So uh, they make revolutionary educational uh, learning experiences. So that is one of the things. Then um, besides education and learning, we have... uh, 
uh, in shopping and retail. Uh, there are virtual storerooms and virtual galleries. So we can check whether our clothes fit and what kind of fashion suits us. We have virtual fitting rooms. Then the IKEA, their uh, AR app through which uh, they can visualize their furniture in their homes and choose accordingly. So that is one of the things in shopping and retail. Then um, it helps in navigation and um, augmented reality. Suppose it allows to overlay directions in the real world. So it helps us in areas where uh, unknown areas to navigate way to specific address and addresses and all. So with the help of augmented reality, makes navigation easier. Then also a lot of social media platforms like Snapchat and Instagram, you can use filters and all and play with your photos and videos. So that is one of the use cases. Then in healthcare, you can use metaverse. One is, as I told you, you can uh, use for uh, virtual surgeries and all. And then uh, you can also use virtual treatments, virtual reality treatments to, for therapy. So the patient, they did not uh, visit the doctors or healthcare professionals, they can have a uh, virtual visit from anywhere in the world. And uh, a lot of things like patients can also be treated for PTSD, which is a post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. So through therapy sessions in controlled environments, we can uh, help the patients to face their fears. Then also a lot of uh, virtual reality sessions and uh, mental health treatment and physical rehab in patients can be done too. We are uh, therapy and uh, also uh, uh, another platform called Exile Health. So we, this is one of the use cases in healthcare. Then last of all, Metaverse can help in real estate where you can actually buy virtual land to the Metaverse, to the blockchain, and you can transfer property rights to um, another electric uh, technology called the NFT. So this is one of the things besides that uh, the Metaverse helps you know, to post events, showrooms, and galleries. So everything happens virtually. And then there are platforms like Decentraland and Sandbox. Uh, where you can uh, develop land, monetize land, and transfer ownership of lands to other uh, buyers. So these are some of the real-life use cases of the Metaverse. Yeah. So, you know, I'll ask a serious question. Is Metaverse good for us as a society? Would you allow your own kids to spend like six hours in Metaverse? Uh, see, every new technology, uh, when it comes, there are a lot of challenges. Like in the beginning when the internet had come, so in the 90s, when the internet was introduced, there were a lot of challenges. The kids had gone in websites and were concerned. Then a lot of applications came out for their safety and security. So with every new technology, there will be a lot of security risks or potential threats. But as time goes by, the developers and the experts will be working on it. So every technology has their own pros and cons. So uh, metaverse uh, in the beginning it appears like that like whatsapp had come out and we, had, we thought i mean that and that is too much like doing everything on whatsapp then on video calls or messages so many things have changed now but we, when we adopt a new technology there are fears but then there are a lot of practical applications but of course it has to be ethically used with time and as and when the technology progresses these things will be looked into too and it will become a safer world absolutely ma'am so let's jump from one uh, revolutionary technology to another one. So what are your thoughts on blockchain technology? And why is it considered revolutionary? Blockchain, you can say it is a chain of blocks designed into digital nature. And um, it is secure, transparent, and uh, it keeps track of whatever transactions are happening. It is decentralized, so no single person is in control of the venture because the ledger is spread across different computers or different nodes. So uh, what happens is nobody can tamper with it. Whatever transactions have happened, nobody can tamper with it because it's not on one centralized server. It's uh, spread across computers. So if one has to be tampered, the record has to be changed on all the other computers. That's why it is very secure. It is transparent. And also it cuts the middleman and hence it becomes faster, cheaper, and more trustworthy. Hence the blockchain is... Uh, Revolutionary. As far as explaining blockchain in simple terms, but how is blockchain influencing our daily life with some practical application? Can you share uh, some of the top practical applications of blockchain technology? 
So um, as I told you, um, blockchain is something which is transparent, secure, and it doesn't require the middleman. And uh, let me just uh, pick a little more on blockchain. I think I can explain it uh, better. It, you can say it is a chain of transactions, and the transactions are linked in the form of blocks. All these blocks are chained together. And so what happens is there are a series of transactions happening, and when the transaction is to full, it forms a block. Then the second transaction starts. And uh, one second uh, set of transaction is pulled. It forms a second block. So the blocks are linked into a chain. And each of the blocks, they have uh, a cryptographic call called a hash. So um, each of them has a unique hash. And every subsequent block has the hash of the previous block. As A, B, C, D, as, as each block increases, it will have its own hash as well as the hash of the previous block. This is the reason it is very secure because I kind of didn't uh, mention that in my previous answer. So I want to mention this before going for the practical application. This is the reason it is very secure and transparent because if a hacker tries to hack into the blockchain, what happens is he can't just break the code or break the password and get into it. He has to change every block and which is not humanly possible. So that is one of the reasons why blockchain is very secure. So that is one of the practical application. It is integrated into the IT network, which makes the IT network very secure. And um, it has many other uh, applications. One is it's used in cross-border transactions. What happens is between countries, there are a lot of rules and regulations for transactions. But with blockchain, the transactions are very secure because, as I said, everything is recorded on the block and it is immutable. Nobody can particularly change it. So there's a platform called uh, RippleNet. They make payments across countries faster, secure, without the requirement of a uh, middleman, and it's a low-cost transaction. So a lot of banks and uh, payment providers, they use a uh, blockchain platform for cross-border transactions. But then secondly, blockchain is also in integrated into the supply chain of food products. So what happens is we can change the entire food chain. So when we are transferring goods, uh, we are transferring from, say, India, the United States. So the entire uh, supply chain, everything is recorded on the blockchain. Say the source of goods to which countries it's going through. Uh, it will record the temperature. Is the temperature causing food wastage? With the help of the blockchain, a lot of companies like say Walmart are being out tracing the journey of the supply chain to improve food safety and reduce wastage. So that is one of the practical applications of the blockchain. Then again, um, as we very well know nowadays, digital currencies like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are used widely. And again, um, they are used for purchases, online investments, and remittances. And again, it does not require intermediaries and it is low cost and very fast. So that is one of the practical applications of digital currencies. Then we have also smart contracts. Now, what are smart contracts? The smart contracts are digital agreements that are written in code. And once it's, uh, the code is written in a certain way with certain conditions. So once the certain conditions are met, these digital agreements um, are executed. So these are the smart contracts. So what happened, a lot of companies are adopting smart contracts, say, let's say in real estate company insurance. So what happens? If things are automated, uh, like saying, suppose um, in real estate, if somebody is um, buying a certain piece of land, uh, so well, once he pays the money, uh, the ownership will be transferred from the seller to the buyer. So this is automated. So what is the condition? The condition is that the uh, money has been transferred and hence the ownership has been given to the buyer. So that is one in real estate. Then uh, say uh, in insurance. In insurance, what happens? Uh, people are giving claim. Suppose there is a flight delay. There will be certain thresholds of three hours. So once the app, um, the regulates and find out that there's a demo, so the passenger will get an insurance for the flight to me. Similarly, smart contracts are used. Like say, suppose a landowner uh, is going to get his property. So the smart contract will have the conditions of um, how much security deposit paying, what is the lease, what is the monthly rent. So at a certain date, as soon as the tenant he play uh, on a certain day, date, the code will be written in such a way that on a certain date, the uh, money is transferred to the tenant from his bank account of the tenant to the owner. So these are smart contracts. So these are one of the use cases and which is used in a lot of industries like say the supply chain industry. 
So once the supply of goods has has gone through, the payment will be triggered. So these are the use cases of, uh, of smart contracts. Then we have digital identities. So what happens is digital identities, they are like the virtual passports so or ID cards, you can say. So uh, instead of having a central authority uh, or to uh, manage our digital um, our identities, we can have, uh, there are platforms like Sovereign, uh, they manage our digital identities. What we can do is we can control our personal information online and we can choose to share what information we want to share. Suppose we need to show our identity. So we can show our name and uh, date of birth without showing our whole address. So we can control what kind of information we are sharing and we can control all our personal information through this platform. So this is one of the use cases. So these are some of the use cases of the block. So. Wow. Great explanation there, ma'am. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to ask because, you know, blockchain started somewhere in 2008. It's mm -hmm. been close to 16 years since the blockchain technology has come into the limelight. And there has been many ups and downs. But why has the technology not caught up? Uh, why is it not mainstream? You rarely see any startup who is exclusively working on blockchain. And at the same time, you have I've seen at least 10 startups who were ultimately turned out to be a scam. So, so do you think uh, blockchain technology has a very bright future or is it doomed to fail? See, every technology, there will be challenges because one thing is it technically will be complex and there will be need for specialized skills. So people will have to be trained accordingly and the technical support has to be trained with the latest technology. Secondly, there will be high cost involved for uh, developing this technology and their implementation. So that is one of the challenges. So people are also scared of uh, security issues, their privacy concerns. So those are one of the challenges. And then uh, different countries have different regulatory and compliance rules and measures. So those issues will be there. Uh, like say, um, some in US and on, lots of uh, the government has recognized the importance of the blockchain technology in the cryptocurrency. So uh, it is legal in India, it is legal, but with some kind of uh, regulatory measures. In some countries, it is not uh, legal. I think in some of the African countries, Bangladesh, and so on. So some of the countries, even China, there's some kind of regulation. It is not totally free. So these are the different issues. And then uh, even the users, uh, they have to be aware of this technology and how how it can help them. Um, they have to be aware of it. So these are the reasons why it is taking time for startups to adopt these technologies. But you know, it is immensely useful. There are a lot of practical uh, applications and there are a lot of security transparency. Since you know this, um, the digital world has become a a lot of cyber attacks, a lot of cyber threats, it just become very scary and uh, it was not safe. So with adoption of blockchain technology, as people become aware of it, as the, you know, the technology gets more, more cost efficient, it will be more and more prevalent. But it will take time. Just like, in, just like the internet, can you imagine our parents using WhatsApp and the internet and they would be very, uh, we used to be very irritated when we were busy with gadgets like the television or the radio. So that was that time. Now, again, that apprehension towards a new technology. But once we use it and see its use, so uh, it will become more and more prevalent. And as I said, as like a previously mobile phones or a laptop were very costly, but then now everybody in India has a mobile phone. It's got cheaper because technology has got advanced. So once it becomes cheaper and more uh, cost efficient, more and more startups we get into technology, and uh, more and more awareness come, and the younger crowd uh, they get into learning technology and upgrading themselves, this will get more prevalent. So I hope that answers you. No, it does. So now let's talk about NFT, which is I think a subset of blockchain, if I'm not uh, wrong. Yes, that's true. NFT cannot exist without the blockchain. So you can say NFT are digital certificates uh, online for unique items. Yeah, it can be a video or it can be a piece of art or it can be even your tweets. It is a unique uh, item. And um, what makes it special, it's, it's, it's not that cryptocurrencies. There are a lot of cryptocurrencies, but NFT is something which is uh, very unique. And um, nowadays there's a lot of uh, buzz because 
it is changing the way we are uh, doing business uh, online that is selling and buying stuff because it has opened every open up avenues for artists and creators to make a lot of money so uh, in more technical terms you can say um the the nft is like a digital um, badge and they are created and stored on the blockchain technology since you know the blockchain technology is very secure and it is um, transparent so uh, what you whenever you buy an nft on the blockchain it gets recorded on the blockchain so everybody knows who owns that nft uh, who's the owner of that art or who's the owner of the tweet or a photo or a video and so whatever we have on on it it gets a digital certificate of authenticity so it authenticates all our stuff on the internet by giving it a unique digital certificate so that is the reason it is um, picking up and it is getting there's a great buzz around it you can say makes sense so uh, nfts are gaining a, a lot of attention uh, what are the latest trends in nft that you know brands and businesses should be aware of uh, so what is happening is one of the uh, biggest trends is the digital art people are buying and selling nfts is almost like physical art so what happens is besides the art people are also like um, buying virtual land on the metaverse the whatever land they own, own they have a unique nft so it would come with its own properties like when it was created, its own uh, time stamp, stamp, who is the owner, who it has been sold to. So it will come with its own properties and everybody will know who is the owner of that NFT. So another trend is uh, virtual land is being bought by integrating with NFT, then it is used in gaming, it is used in the music industry. So many things, like a lot of artists, they are uh, doing virtual concerts and people are attending this uh, virtual concerts I think Travis, he was uh, one of the artists uh, who had conducted a Metaverse concert on, on Fortnite platform. So a lot of people attended this from their homes and it was like attending a live concert. So a lot of virtual concerts can be attended without leaving uh, your home. And um, then uh, you can buy uh, digital art and display them on virtual galleries. You can uh, have a virtual home. Uh, on the uh, metaverse and display rare digital art so that that was one of the thing you know, you can you know, through virtual reality and the metaverse you can do a lot of buying and sending of digital art and showcasing them uh, through virtual homes or through uh, virtual rooms that is one of the things and in gaming um, NFT what it does is you can buy uh, game items in different games you can buy say weapons uh, skins different uh, clothes that the uh, that your avatar will wear or different uh, whatever are the players in the game so you can buy them and sell them elsewhere it has got value it's got a lot of tangible value and it's like selling uh, a physical object and making money so that is one of the users then in social media users can sell uh, their content as nft so say you can buy a limited edition of a song or uh, so you can buy a particular meme and you can sell it to somebody else or you can um, you can monetize your content. There are different ways you can sell and buy your own social media content and make money. So that is one of the use cases, uh, trends in NFT. Another thing is as more and more people uh, use NFT, it will get faster and cheaper because uh, there will be more awareness and uh, more people will be able to participate in the NFT network. And especially because Ethereum and many other blockchains, they are working on the upgrades to make it more secure. Then there'll be more rules and regulations around it. So a lot of artists and uh, creators, they will be authenticated on the blockchain before they can do any purchasing and sending. So that is one of the things of the NFT. And a um, lot of rare use cases uh, of NFT, uh, like the, you can say one artist called Beeple, he made $16 million by sending his art in an auction called Christie Auction. So these are some of the things that uh, NFT is really picking up and artists and singers and so on. So using NFTs, they can uh, do a lot of buying, sending of their online work. And it has become very lucrative and there's a great buzz around the sending and um, buying of NFTs. When artists and on, they can get some of the items um, of a particular like say the autograph or they can sell, sell a piece of art done by them and they can make uh, give different uh, time stamps each of the items so it will become a unique NFT to the user so it gives a sense of ownership and hence 
people that want to owe a piece of their favorite artist work, a piece of them you can sing. So NFTs are already trendy in the metaverse right now and in the real world. Wow. Thanks a lot for uh, explaining that to us, ma'am. And thanks a lot for coming on X User Podcast, at sharing your story and you know explaining the basic stuff related to Web3. Any parting thoughts you might have, ma'am? My parting thoughts is uh, to be aware of the latest technologies. Right now, we are transitioning to Web3. So currently, the current internet is called the Web2, where we are the content creators. So let me just give a, a quick explanation. In the beginning, we had Web1. Web1 consisted of static websites where you could only read and absorb the content. You couldn't contribute. So we had those static websites, those news websites like CNN, BBC. We could not contribute. Whatever information was given to us, uh, we had to absorb. Then slowly came Web2, like Facebook and all court on YouTube. So here we became the content creators. We could contribute to content as well as absorb it. So we had a say in whatever happened. So we were in the Web2 phase. Now we are going to transition into Web3, where it will be more immersive and virtual, but with more security and transparency around the technology. There will be a stop to monopoly by certain companies. So this is the reason which is very important that we are aware of what the technology is going on right now. And we try to know and learn about it. So when the transition happens, to being comfortable to us and we can quickly adapt to the changes in the Web3 world. Well said, ma'am. So, Pratibha, ma'am, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast and sharing your thoughts and journey. It was really amazing. Thank you, Avinash. Um, it was great talking to you. And yes, we covered quite a bit, but there are a lot of things still to cover. I don't know if I could uh, say it all or I could give enough information. But I've been looking forward to, uh, to this platform to be aware of the latest technology and trends. And thank you very much for inviting me. It was completely our pleasure, ma'am. Thank you for tuning in to this enlightening episode of Yes Users Podcast. We hope you found our conversation with Pradibha Das as inspiring and insightful as we did. Remember to follow Yes Users Podcast on your favorite podcast platform for more engaging episodes with industry leaders and innovators. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review and share this podcast within your network. Until next time, keep saying yes to learning and to your users' feedback. This is your host Avinash Tripathi signing off. Thanks a lot for listening.